His name is David. He's missing. And today, police announced a shift in how they're trying to find him. His name is Gary, and he's leaving the Broncos, leaving us looking for new names to replace him. His name was Sid. And when we told you how he helped liberate a concentration camp, turns out we were just scratching the surface of his impact on this world. Her name is Josie, and she has a healthy view of New Year's resolutions. Apparently my cousin thinks that I should be less annoying, so I'll attempt at that, That's but so nice. I'm making no promises. We resolve, now we promise, to bring you a balanced look at the highs and lows of our community each day. This is next. Please take a moment to look and listen, because six-year-old David Puckett is likely running out of time, running out of ways that his disappearance ends well, ends with good news. An expected briefing from Aurora Police at 5.30 has been delayed. You'll see it live here when it happens. David wandered away from his house in Aurora 48 hours ago. He lives near Olympic and Park, Yale and Chambers. He was wearing a tan jacket, camo pants, black boots with an orange stripe on them. He's four feet tall. Now, he has wandered off before. Police do not think that he was abducted, but it's clear that David's running out of good options at this point. He's either out there on his own for two days and counting with deeper cold on the way, or he is inside somewhere with someone who is not supposed to have him. Someone who's made the choice not to call police despite widespread media reports all weekend, despite door-to-door -door searches in the neighborhood, and despite reverse emergency calls to the 27,000 people who live within two and a half miles of there. Now, as for the Amber Alert, the belated one issued this afternoon, law enforcement said all weekend that David's case did not meet the tough criteria for an Amber Alert. Today, they said that they felt that the passage of time in the colder weather meant that his life was in imminent danger, as required for an Amber Alert. Now, I understand you can agree or you can disagree with the decision to delay the Amber Alert to issue it now, but all that talk can wait for the time being. What's important is getting David's name and his photo in front of people who may have been disconnected from the news over the holiday weekend. You can find shareable links on the next Facebook page, any other media outlet in town. Visit whichever one you like. Please help circulate his story. 5,000 or so people in the Denver area started this year like they ended the last homeless. Last year, during the most recent widespread survey, about 15% reported sleeping outside without any shelter. Slept outside, despite the availability of open shelter beds in Denver. We begin this year's coverage of Denver's homelessness crisis by exploring the single most asked question that we got last year. Why do so many of the city's homeless refuse to sleep in shelters? Our search for an answer led us to the alley, where a man named Troy Montoya used to sleep. I believe my homelessness started with my addiction. Um, once my addiction took off, I noticed that my mental health was also taking off. And once you're in homelessness, I think you're stuck. My name is Troy Montoya. I'm an alcoholic. I decided to live on the streets as opposed to a homeless shelter. I think a lot of people don't understand that there's many people that don't want to stay at the shelters, and I'm one of those people. Um, for me, I saw somebody stabbed in the shelter once. Um, I have post-traumatic stress disorder. Any loud noises or erratic behavior of somebody else can trigger me. So for me, until I got my mental health stable, I just really was not, I was not a good candidate to stay in the shelters. So the streets, you know, I was alone. I could deal with the problem alone. I didn't have to take on anybody else's baggage while I was there. I know that when I stayed back here, oftentimes I would leave food behind for the next person. Um, obviously somebody's staying here. You know, so we help each other out by sometimes if I had an extra sweater, I would leave it here. Um, I would leave my cardboard behind because if I wasn't here, at least somebody could get off the cold pavement. If some people just have lost so much and been beaten down so long that they just lost hope. And I think when you just smile at somebody and you say good morning, that means more to me than anything is to be acknowledged as a person. It's very hard for me to walk these streets because I still get very emotional because it could happen to me again at any point and it could happen to you at any point. Troy tells us that he's staying with family these days as he works to rebuild his life. There are plans for two new shelters in Denver, and the city is studying why about 15% of the homeless population refuses to come in from the cold. We're looking to explore this topic from a variety of angles and perspectives this year. Let us know your ideas or your thoughts. Email next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. 
Big news out of Dove Valley today. News that immediately starts a search for the best candidate available. Expect some high profile names to be contacted soon after John Elway announced that he will not run for governor of Colorado. Elway's somewhat politically active. He's a Republican. And as you heard D District Attorney George Brockler say here on Next last week, Elway's the only guy who would clear the field for him. Elway told us today he's sticking with football and sticking with finding the Broncos' next head coach. We will get into Mike Kliss's predictions on possible candidates in just a minute. But first, we are, we are really struck today by something in Coach Gary Kubiak's retirement press conference about how much it meant for him to work for a friend in John Elway. May we all someday be so fortunate as to have a boss who is also a friend. We all have had our bosses that we have a hard time talking to. Well, he's my boss, but we sat down and we talked well into the night as a player, as an executive. And folks, I want y'all to know one thing. He is so supportive of me and he's the best in the business to work for. And I wish I could continue to do that. But unfortunately, I can't. But John, thanks so much, bud. I love you. You'll hear a lot of names mentioned as contenders to coach the Broncos. Now, Mike Kliss, our Broncos reporter, he's dedicated to the beat enough that he got a personal thank you in Kubiak's retirement speech. So who else to help us cut through the noise and focus on the key names? The Broncos don't waste time when it comes to their coaching search here at UC Health Training Center. A little bit before Gary Kubiak stepped before the podium and formally announced his retirement, the Broncos did seek permission to interview Kyle Shanahan, the offensive coordinator from the Atlanta Falcons. That interview will probably happen this weekend, I would guess Saturday. Shanahan, of course, the son of the great Broncos coach, Mike Shanahan. Mike Shanahan was the best head coach in Broncos history. He has the, the most wins. He also has those two Super Bowl titles from 97 and 98, roughly about the time Kyle was finishing up high school at Cherry Creek. Shanahan would be a good one because it's a similar West Coast system. Instead of West Coast 1.0 that Elway played with in 98, it's more like West Coast 6.0 that Shanahan is directing now. Vance Joseph, who is a former teammate of Matt Russell at the University of Colorado. Russell is Elway's right-hand man. Joseph, now the defensive coordinator for the Miami Dolphins, he also will get an interview. So those are the top two candidates right now. We noted the passing of Sid Schaffner last week, and we used the word hero for his role in liberating the Nazi concentration camp at Dachau. Sid did not like that word, but we don't get to choose the words that are applied to us. And Marcel Levy told the world that hero fit Sid, that it applied to the man who saved his life in 1945. Marcel and Sid became lifelong friends. And since Sid died at the age of 95, we've learned about the words that described his work in Denver as a property owner and a landlord. Words like kind and generous. Tonight, a new look at the local legacy of Sid Schaffner. It feels very much like we've lost a member of our family. It feels like I've lost a grandfather. Every place that I've lived in, he's either sold me or he's owned. <laughs> so I, I honestly don't know where I would have been had I not met Sid. We didn't have a lot of money at the time and he worked with us, lowered the rent for us so that we could afford, afford a house. I honestly believe that he had the, the properties that he had so that he could help people like us. Rents have become uh, exceedingly high. He just never seemed like he was trying to make money off of it. If you were late on your rent, he would come over and visit you and say, are, are you having a rough time? Is there something I can do to help you? My name is Alan Schaffner and I'm Sid's youngest son. When I started assisting him when he was you know, getting older, 91, 92, um, I'd recommend to him, uh, you may want to consider raising, his rent, raising the rents on your properties. And he said, absolutely not. And then I, you know, I tell him, well, you know, this month was you know, a little tight. And he'd say, that's no problem. What do you need? And he'd you know, knock $100 off the rent that month if, if that's what we needed. And he wouldn't he wouldn't make me pay it back. Uh, he just wanted to make sure that his tenants had a place to stay, that they had a safe place to stay, they had a uh, roof uh, over their head. You know, I, I hope everybody remembers 
all of his stories and just who he was and what he did for our world. This world is definitely a little less better off without him here. Sid Schaffner survived by his wife, three children, seven great-grandchildren, two great-grandchildren, and many grateful tenants. We're awaiting that briefing any moment now from Aurora Police on today's Amber Alert for six-year-old David Puckett. If you've not yet shared his photo and his story with your friends on social media, we invite you to do that before we return. Every weather forecast comes with an asterisk subject to change, and there is a big asterisk change in this week's weather outlook. I mean, the guy did not know how to lie. Something I never knew about Gary Kubiak explains a lot about what we saw today and why the journalists in the room did something rare. They clapped. And if you, like me, have given up on New Year's resolutions, tonight we renew our belief that personal improvement is possible. My goal is to um, hold my breath for longer. Next, we'll be right back. But don't hold your breath. I think the commercial's like, what, two minutes long? We've reached 52 degrees officially as a high today. That came around lunchtime by one. Temperatures had dropped to 30. A cold front pushed through, also bringing snow up to our mountains, where winter weather advisories remain in place. Anywhere from 5 to 10 new inches to 8 to 14 new inches of snow still expected to fall through 6 p.m. tomorrow in our northern and central mountains. Tonight will stay cloudy here in Denver with a low of 11. Winds will be a little breezy out of the northeast at 5 to 15 miles per hour. Then tomorrow only 26 for a high cold with mostly cloudy skies and a few flurries but no major snow at that point 21 your high on Wednesday 17 on Thursday 19 Friday and we do have a chance for accumulating snow coming in Wednesday afternoon and into Thursday Kyle at this point it looks like several inches of snow will fall but the system's still not on shore yet so we're going to be changing these numbers throughout the week Ah, I see. That's why we got to keep watching. All right, Becky, thank you. So at any point now, Aurora Police may step to the microphone and provide that update on today's Amber Alert. Six-year-old David Puckett's been missing for 48 hours as of 6 o'clock. We're going to go live for that briefing just as soon as it happens. You gave a number of your neighbors a raise in 2017 when voters approved an increase in the state's minimum wage. Politics guy Brandon Ridman looks at how we now stack up against other states. Colorado's minimum wage is going up this year, and it will again for the next several years because the voters passed Amendment 70 back in November. On New Year's Day, the minimum wage went up 99 cents, now $9.30 an hour. People who make tips, like waiters, bartenders, they'll keep on making $3.02 less per hour. And then for the next three years, we'll see a 90-cent increase every New Year's Day until we get to $12 an hour in the year 2020. After that, you'll see automatic increases for inflation smaller ones like we've had in years past. The state says the people most likely to benefit from the increase are retail salespeople, food service workers, child care workers, janitors, and home health aides. Colorado's not alone this year. 21 states have an increase in the minimum wage going into 2017, and our new $9.30 is roughly in the middle of the pack. But when we get to $12 an hour, we are poised to be in a smaller club of states near the top. New York and Washington, D.C. are the only two places to hit $12 an hour this year. California is headed to 12, but they won't get there until 2019. And when Colorado gets to $12 an hour in the year 2020, we're going to be joined by at least four other states who've already passed a law to do so. We will not be the highest minimum wage, though, at $12 an hour. New York and California, they're going to keep ramping up until they get to $15 an hour. Oregon and Washington have plans to go to 13 and a half. For next, I'm Brandon Ritterman. Other places that have increased the minimum wage more quickly than we are have seen mixed results. There were employers that cut back hours to make up for those higher costs. Next, we'll return shortly with a side of Coach Gary Kubiak that I never knew until today. It's the second day of the new year, which means you're watching next from a treadmill. Good luck with that. Photojournalist Ann Herbst turned her lens toward 2017 with an eye to anything but exercise. A New Year's resolution, I think, is kind of like something you want to do better. Interviewing adults about New Year's resolutions is just so 2016. It's all about the gym and eating better and blah, blah, blah. Well, most of the ones that I know say they want to get more active or lose weight or eat better, stuff like that. Instead. Yeah! 
let's hear from people who don't have the same old goals. I want to be better at dance. I'm an actor, so I want to try to, this year, maybe more audition for more things. To have a cleaner room. Oh, in the winter, we're just kind of sitting yeah. on the couch, playing Xbox and all of that stuff. So yeah, I think it would be better to get outside a little more. I know, I kind of want to be more positive than I was last year. My goal is in swimming class. My goal is to um, to hold my breath for longer. Um, mine's actually to go ice skating more because I really enjoy it and I want to start getting into it more. Two days in, she's off to a good start. As for school, it comes up a lot. I don't really know multiplication very good, so I want to sort of get better at multiplication. Maybe get a better grade in science. And I want to be able to just enjoy whatever I'm doing and be in the moment instead of being like, ah, I have homework. Less homework and uh, my sister to be a bit nicer. <laughs> Good luck with that and especially with this. I want to have even more fun this year. Me too. That's pretty much it. That's my New Year's resolution. For next, this is Ann Herbst. Our next question comes from viewer Joni McQuain. Are the honeybees on top of the Brown Palace's roof still there? My understanding is the Brown uses some of the honey in their meals and sells some. We have your answer, Joni. The bees are still there. They had a rough year. The Brown Palace says they only produced about 100 pounds of honey. Normally, it's 150 pounds. The hotel uses it in shampoo, conditioner, chapstick that they give out to the guests. It's also used in spa treatments and sometimes in the kitchen. They will sell a bit of honey as well. We asked the Brown Palace if they'll continue to keep bees on the roof, and they said, absolutely. They're just hoping next year they're a bit more productive. That is a common New Year's resolution. Hey, Joni's question got us thinking about the bee colony on top of Union Station, and it was tough to be a bee last year. That colony contracted the disease, and the beekeeper at Union Station doesn't expect that many of them will make it through the winter. She's considering repopulating the Union Station beehives in the spring. Aurora police are still delaying their scheduled 530 update on today's Amper Alert. We're keeping track of that situation. Next, a personal perspective on Coach Gary Kubiak. Anyone who thought he didn't have a prayer didn't know the coach. When Broncos coach Gary Kubiak concluded his retirement announcement today, reporters in the room applauded. That doesn't happen. It shows you the rare level of respect in their relationship. Our Broncos guy, Mike Cliffs, gives us some insight into what makes Kubiak special. What struck me about Gary Kubiak is just how honest he was at his press conference. I mean, the guy did not know how to lie. I think, and I hope people will forgive me for this, but I think it has a lot to do with his Catholic background. Do you realize Gary Kubiak in his office every morning, and he's here 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, one of the first ones here, and he watches Catholic Mass uh, in his office every single morning while he's also watching film and tape of the game and he's preparing his game plan. That says something about Gary Kubiak. Uh, he's, you know, he married his high school sweetheart. They have three sons. He really is kind of an all-American boy uh, who made good. And he got the Super Bowl title. I think his wick was short when he got here as far as his coaching career was concerned, but no regrets. His first year, the Broncos win the Super Bowl title. All in all, a successful run for Gary Kubiak. We wish him happiness and good health. We're hearing from our team of reporters in Aurora that police there are planning to offer their update on tonight's Amber Alert at 7 o'clock. That briefing was originally scheduled for 5, kept getting pushed back without explanation. 9 News is going to stream that update live on 9news.com and also live on Facebook. If you haven't already, please share David Puckett's photo and story. You can find it on the next Facebook page. We want to get it in front of anybody who might not have seen it. We'll keep you updated throughout the evening and see you next time.